G'day guys, welcome back to Supercoach with DR and welcome to the round six stock market video. Before I get into the stocky this week, I'm extremely humbled. I just wanted to say thank you very, very much. The channel has now reached 2,000 subscribers in just over a year and a bit. It really, really does mean a lot to me. I think we've built a really, really outstanding community here full of great people. You know, even last week when I talked about my son being a little bit crook, having an operation, all the messages of support and, you know, get well wishes were just flattering to us and uh, he really appreciated it. I did show him all the comments there and he personally wants to say thank you very much for that. So just a small example of why we've got a great community here and I do really, really appreciate the support. So thank you very much for that. Cannot thank you enough and extremely humbled as I've already said before but enough of the soppy stuff we are here for the round six stock market video it's a really really big week so strap yourself in for about an hour and a half and as another I suppose thank you I will be making some sacrifices to the super coach gods tomorrow or the next day just before the start of round seven that's going to be on behalf of all the community so we can start to change our luck and turn things around a little bit because i know that josh dunkley was a really popular selection in the super coach with dr community Lockie neil lots of us had as well particularly when we started the season and unfortunately both of these blokes now a must trade out throwing dusty martin with his concussion and some leg issues apparently now that makes things a little bit dicey as well certainly don't look to trade dusty out keep on to him because remember every man this dog that doesn't own dusty will jump on him as soon as he's right for the picking so without going on too much we'll get straight into it there is a lot to talk about particularly with some of these forward options we can bring in for dunkley it's going to be a really interesting situation this week do you try to go with a little bit of value do you go for one of those out and out premiums i'll discuss all the selections as well as some downgrade options this week so as always let's start off with the premium defenders the man at the top of the list this week is Christian Salem. Unbelievably, after a massive 160 plus on the weekend, has an identical season average to the Seagull and ranked fourth for total points. At this stage of the season, he's a top six defender, but remember that that monster score on the weekend has really boosted his average. I didn't think he'd score as well with May back in the team, but that obviously wasn't the case, and he's really snuck up on me Salem. He probably doesn't have the premium scoring history for me to bring him into my side, but his super coach output has been extremely positive and he's a massive pod. A nice, reliable user of the ball, playing for one of the informed teams in the comp. He's projected to go up another 30 plus K this week and the Jelly Tyson Salem deal would be coming a little bit easier for the D supporters to stomach. Next man, Tommy Stewart. I feel like I'm just on repeat with this bloke, but I'll say it again. If you're looking for a defender with a great role, many scoring avenues that will give you an 85 to 110 basically every week, then get him in. Third highest average for all defenders and second for total points. Probably the safest defensive option of 2021. A big fan of this selection. Cal Mills, really like him as a player, is now the number one ranked defender for total points and second for season average only behind Jordan Ridley. Has had two really nice scores along with some just okay scores. Obviously a new role for him this year as an inside midfielder, but actually spent a bit of time in the defensive line last game. He's got a really nice ceiling, pretty high floor. I don't think a heap can go wrong with this pick, but the round 14 buy does make him a difficult trade-in if you've already got the likes of Laird, Ryan, uh, Seagull, who all share the same buy. But uh, yeah, I'm a fan of Cal Mills, super, super player. Doherty, being brilliant over last month, probably in the second tier of premium defenders in my opinion, but actually now looks like a pretty safe option. Apologies to Doc. I had the trap on him after the first couple of weeks. I was wrong. I was simply wrong on that, I think. But I don't think he'll get back to that 2016, 2017 form. But even if he doesn't, 100 to 105 average seems pretty realistic. He's not a sexy option, but he could go worse and also has a pretty friendly buy. Next on the list, my man Dan Rich. I bought him up a few weeks ago as a pot option, and if you had a gone with him, you would have been really happy with what he's produced. He's lived up to his nickname and gone bam, bam, bam with a three-round average of 108 and has been a really consistent scorer this year. Takes a large majority of the kickouts, as we know. They love getting the ball in his hands. And he now actually finds himself in the top six 
for highest averaging defenders in 2021. I don't think there's any reason to suggest that he'll drop off and just seems like a really safe and solid option. I'd probably have him at least equal with Jaden Short, albeit Short probably has the largest ceiling. Luke Ryan, slowly starting to hit some form, was in that upper echelon of defenders last year, but hasn't quite replicated that form yet. Tapes and kick-ins, can intercept, wins his own ball, a high disposal can on many occasions, and does have a massive ceiling. We haven't seen him hit the roof yet, so I'd still be holding off for now, but certainly someone to take a close look at. Again, though, has around 14 by, which is unfortunate. Rory Laird, don't need a lot of discussion, I don't think, about Laird. Most people have got him, probably below expectations for a season average at this stage, but I hold no concerns whatsoever for Laird. He is absolutely as safe as houses. He's also got that added DPP status, which is real bonus. can come in handy, particularly close to the buys, if you can swing him with another defensive mid. And it can also up, open up some extra trade options and may allow you to select a middle defender, for example, for a Jordan Clark type. Uh, Dan Houston, 500,600, had a really bright start to the season, but has tapered off a little. Not a great three-round average, but it has been injury-affected, which we need to take into account. Is now spending some more time in the mid. So it's a type of player that is flexible for the coach, flexible for the team, but this isn't always great for Supercoach, though we normally like to select players with well-defined roles. But look, he's certainly someone that will have a very good chance to finish in the top six, eight defenders if all things go right. You all know that he's one of my burn men, but I may need to give him another chance at some stage, I think. Jaden Short, as I said, had the safest houses pick on him a few weeks ago, which I do apologize for because the house is now slowly starting to burn down. Look, the situation isn't that dire, I suppose, and I still hold some faith that he'll bounce back, but it does seem like Basher may be affecting him more than what I first thought. I wouldn't be bringing in Short at this stage, but at the same time, I wouldn't be trading him. I think most of us have more pressing issues than Jaden Short at the moment. And if he is your number one issue at the moment, then you must be going bloody well, I think. But look, it's frustrating for owners as he's dropped off. Sets lose about 30K if he can score around the 90 mark. So yeah, nowhere near as confident as what I was on Short even a couple of weeks ago. And finally, Jordan Ridley, welcome back, mate. We missed you last week. For non-owners, this is such a blessing, and to be completely honest, it's pure luck that you just didn't have him. You've just really lucked out here if you didn't already have Jordan Ridley in your team. I did the right thing, brought him in before his price rise, and just super, super frustrating that now non-owners can bring him in for a bargain price as compared to what he can produce. We'll return to the role he's been playing from rounds one to five, and I'm expecting him to continue to be the number one man in defense. So if you are a non-Ridley owner, Wait a couple of weeks and just bring in this man an absolute non-negotiable and a must-have in our defensive lines. On to the defenders, 250 to 500k. Looking at this list, there's not a heap of players that I like. I can't highly recommend anyone on this list, but we will get into a little bit of a discussion about a few of these blokes, but I will skip past these fellas pretty quickly. We do need to always look at the man at the top of the list, and at this range this week, it's Aiden Bonner. So 324,100, a season average of 75, three round average of 82, with a negative break even of 13. Looking to go up 40K this week, if he can get around, well, basically right in between his season average and his three round average. So he's been a bit of a failed rookie pick in the past. Some of us had high hopes for him last year as a DPP option in our forward or our midfields, but just didn't work out. And he ended up being a really, really disappointing selection. So I do not have a lot of faith in Aiden Bonner. Look, he is looking to go up 40K, but that price rise is going to be pretty short term. And I cannot see him being anywhere near the top averaging defenders this year. So I just would not look to go there. Such an awkward price point. And that's the issue with many of the blokes that you see in the screen here. What is interesting though, is if you look at the three Port Adelaide defenders here, Darcy Byrne Jones, 422,600, three round average of 101. Ryan Burton also from Port, 404,500, three round average of 102. And then Alia Alia and shout out to I forget your name, sorry mate. Someone did comment on the last last stock market video and asked the question, where's Alia Ali? DR, come on mate, need to give him a little bit of respect and thought, yeah, you know what, I do because I did have him in the first couple of stock markets from memory, but 
sort of had him off the list in the last couple. So thanks for that, mate. Good feedback. And if anyone does have feedback on any plays that I do miss, you would like me to include, just let me know down there in the comments section. I don't take any offense, and I actually appreciate the feedback and, um, you know, people throwing some different options out there. So, uh, yeah, but back to Ali Ali, 443,500, a three-round average of 1010. So you've got three defenders from Port uh, in DBJ, Burton, and Aaliyah with averages of 100 plus for a three rounder this is. But then you look at the season averages. So DBJ, 80, Burton, 88, Aaliyah, 95. So certainly all off their three round average. So certainly in a hot streak, they are playing Brisbane this week, which will be a bit of a tough matchup, I think, for Port. Look, as a line supporter, I'm really scared and probably expect Port to knock us over on the weekend. I'll be... Yeah, absolutely stoked if we can get over the power this week. But, yeah, it's just interesting. Look, are you confident to bring any of these guys into your side? I wouldn't be personally. But if you're looking for an ultra prod, and Port do have a really friendly buy also, um, and that may be something that you do consider. I'm looking for an ultra, an ultra pod. I'm looking for someone with a, really, with a really nice buy. One of these Port defenders may come into your way of thinking so personally i'm not thinking that way myself but if you're looking for an outside of the box idea and focusing on a bit of a different strategy then one of these port blokes may be someone to look at but you keep on to him because break even of 20 look he can he can punch out a 27 or an 87 jordan butts i'm hoping it's on the high end because i'm an owner you definitely no way in the world look to invest in him but you certainly keep him if you got him at the moment. Orazio, another one from Port. Jeez, there's a few Port players on this list, isn't there? Break even of 25. Look, going to be in the chopping block in the next couple. Get rid of him when you want, I think. But with the lack of rookie options and DNPs all over our fields, then you probably just keep on to Fantasia at this stage. Lockie Ash, look at that three-round average, 115. So the best three-round average out of any player on this list. And then the season average of 94, which is pretty good, isn't it, from Ash? I didn't think that he'd average this highly. He's one of those players that you have a quick look at at the start of the season and think, oh, what if, what if, what if this happens, this happens, this happens. But, yeah, he's looking to really break out this season. And he has certainly and very quickly become a really, really important part of that GWS back line. So with a break-even of 45 and a projected score of 111, He's looking to go up around 30K. So he's an ultra pod. If you're looking at someone like that, maybe, but certainly not for me. That's not really the way that I play the game and not a type of player that I'd look to get into my side. A bit too risky for me. Lockie Young, a little bit more money to be made there. Coming, uh, 42% kicking rate, which is interesting. I should have mentioned also, obviously there with Burton, 63% of the kick-ins over the weekend, which obviously will bode well for his scoring. Cummings the same, got a pretty good kick-out percentage rate there, which is obviously helping him to increase that average. And 91, that's pretty good from him. Chapman, now, he could be on the chopping block. You look at that break-even, it's actually in red. I'm not saying you have to trade him out this week. We've got major concerns down there with players either injured or not getting a game at the moment. So, Chapman's probably someone that you look to keep at this stage, but if you haven't got too many problems, I think that you could chop him. You've only made 120K. You want to make 150K or more in an ideal scenario, but I can see circumstances in which you may want to get rid of Chapman, and it's okay to do so if you're in that lucky position at this stage. Quaynor, you know, a pod, but someone that I'm not looking at. McGovern's injured. Maynard, really disappointing season. From him, an average of 78. He started over 500k, around 530-ish, I think, from memory. So 436k now, really disappointing from him. Lever, look, it's it's really hard to fault Jake Lever because he's got an average of 102 on the season now and a three-round average of 106. But at the same time, it's really hard to recommend him. He's, he's an ultra pod. If you've got faith in Melbourne and Jake Lever, then you can go for it. It'll really, really set your back line apart from the pack. But I just couldn't go there myself. And Dougal Howard, 77% of the kick-ins. So without those kick-ins, he'd be an absolute dud of a scorer 
I think Howard, a decent player, don't get me wrong. But super coach wise without the kick-ins, he would just not be relevant. And even with the kick-ins, I still don't really think that he's relevant this year at all. Alex Witherden with a season average of 96, 456,100. I just wouldn't be looking to go there myself. What happens when Hearn comes back into the side? A projected rise of only 4,700 if he goes 87. Just not a fan of Witherden pick. Look, massive, massive ceiling. May work out okay. May, slight chance. But I wouldn't look to go there myself. Duggan, say it every week. Absolute trap. Blake Hardwick. Now, he has really flown under the radar. This bloke has been ultra consistent. Scores of 90, 103, 73, 125, 85, and 108. That's pretty consistent, isn't it? And I think the reason why he's flown under the radar is because there's been some really solid options in our defensive lines this year. Things are changing, though. The landscape is changing. We've already talked about players like Jaden Short, who seem to be losing that ability to score well. So Blake Hardwick has a really good buy. An ultra pod took 66% of the kick-ins over the weekend, which is a really good sign for him. He's someone to at least keep on your watch list as an ultra, ultra pod. Myself, would I go there? No, but I can see why some others may. Jack Crisp, 494,900, projected score of 102. He always goes around the sort of 95 to 100 mark for the season, Crispy. And what you get with Jack Crisp is super, super durability. I don't think he's even missed a game while he's played at Collingwood. So that's how durable that this man actually is. But you're never going to get a huge average from him, you know, like a 105 plus average. But if you're looking for someone that's going to hover around that 95 to 100 mark, then Jack Crisp could be a man, but I'm not interested in him, and he does have the round 14 buy. Zach Williams, durability, always a major concern. Take the risk if you want. Not for me, though. Just hasn't shown enough at this stage. CJ is just being absolutely phenomenal, super coach wise I think the champion data do like this bloke. That may just be my jealousy that I don't have him, but I love watching him play. An exciting type player. Don't invest in him, I don't think. Now, you've missed the boat on him. Is he going to be a keeper? There's a chance that he may. There's actually a chance that he may. There's also a big chance that he may not, and his form or his scores will taper off as the season goes on. But, yeah, if you've got him in your side, you'd be absolutely wrapped. Jordan Clark, I'm just going to put a sell on him. Being the medical sub, look, he may come back into the side. I'm not too sure, but he's got a break even of 89 now. There's nothing to suggest, unless he gets a major change in role, that he's going to increase that season average by a lot or if all. So just sell the bloke, in my opinion. You can't afford to have too many players that A, have really bad job security at that price in your side. You may as well just jump down to another rookie on the bubble, I think, or use him to go up to someone if you've got some spare cash in the bank. Hunter Clark, he's been a bit of a yin-yang, hasn't he? But just keep a watch on him. Some of them I'm not interested in. Brody Smith, an interesting selection here. So you look at his three-round average, that is 105. So pretty healthy from Brody Smith. 42% of the kick-ins. He's kicking the ball long, plays out, pl sorry, plays out, plays on most of the time from the square. So if you're looking for a real pod selection, He's got that mid-forward status as well, which is a mid-forward. Jeez, I've just realized that. Sorry, uh, defensive mid. I must have copied and pasted from the mid-forward section. So apologies for that. These blokes are not mid-forwards. They are defensive midfielders. So apologies for that. But I'm not going back and editing now. It's it's too late. We've gone on too far. So uh, back to Brody Smith. Yeah, look, uh, that DPP stats is Sandy. Has a terrible buy, though has a terrible buy, so it's probably not a realistic option to bring him in due to the fact that we're already littered with round 14 defenders, or most of us are anyway. It's sort of the same with Shoal and uh, any of these guys' keepers. Again, a slight possibility I'd be leaning towards no. And their teammate, Tom Duday, 465,000. Again, durability is a concern. I probably wouldn't go the three Crows blokes, but my best mate, Brent, is a Mad Crow supporter, as I've said a few times before. He's looking at Brody as a bit of a sneaky, sneaky selection. So we'll see what he does in the end. Jordan Dawson, not interested, 30% kickouts. Uh, Jack Bowes, now look at that, only 17% of the kickouts. All of a sudden, that break even 
is 121, where he's only got a three-round average of 91. So that's a 20-point difference there. Still a season average of 105, which is really, really healthy. Certainly the best that you'll see on this list. But I'm nowhere near as confident on Jack Bowes as what I was a couple of weeks ago. I think his role has changed slightly. And there are some warning signs at the moment. Remember in the first four rounds, did not go under 20 kicks in any of those games. Yeah, unfortunately, that's gone down a little bit now. So you've got some slight concerns with Jack Bowes. But again, we've got so many concerns with different players on our side. A lot of it's due to injury and obviously our rookie cash generation. So when I say a concern, it's not a major concern whatsoever having Jack Bowes. And I still think that he's a solid selection. Harris Andrews is a yin-yang. Will go really well one week, then drop a 40 the next. So just don't look to go there. Stephen May. So I'm not looking to jump on him this week. If you look at that negative, oh sorry, negative, the red break even of 139. That's not terrific, and there's no guarantee that he goes 100, so he'll look to go down 33K, but they're only giving him a projected score of 63, which I don't think is enough for Stephen May. Remember, that three-round average is all due to the fact that he had that injury So with the eye socket. And again, the season average also really suffers with that. So with Stephen May, I wouldn't look to get him this week because he will drop down unless he somehow pulls out a 139, which I doubt it. But next week... I think that he might be a popular trading target. The only disadvantage, well, when I say the only, a major disadvantage is the fact that, again, I'll, I'll keep on saying it, round 14 by, durability, certainly a concern, and he has shown that he can go low on the odd occasion, but he can go easily a 115 plus. 58% of the kick-ins is always a positive sign. We have to look for value this year, and Stephen May, I think, at sub 400k, actually screams a bit of value. And Caleb Daniel, 18% of the kick in. So how things change, how our pre-season predictions have gone right out the window with this bloke. Break even of 157, sorry. Projected score of 82, looking to go down another 33K. So who do I prefer out of May and Daniel? I prefer Stephen May personally, but I prefer Caleb Daniel's buy. Onto the defenders, 250k and under. Rats, just play the man, would you? Tommy Highmore, stuck on 117,300 with a negative break even of 68 since the end of round two. As soon as he plays, he will make us some really, really nice coin. If he can hit around the 70 mark, he'll go up over 60k. So, Rats, what are you doing bringing Joyce and these type of players into the side? Give Tommy Highmore a run. And help us out, please, because our defensive lines at the moment, on the bench particularly, yeah, it's looking pretty dire. This bloke here, Jacob Kaczynski, I tell you what, does he enjoy playing down at Tasmania? The second time he's played down there at Tassie and booted six goals. He did do that in the preseason, but after seeing what he's produced from rounds one to five, no one would have been expecting this. I traded him out to Heath Chapman. And at the time, I thought that was a fantastic trade because he's come back in a big, big way. And he'll probably make more coin than Chapman will at this stage. So if he can hit a projected score of 56, he will go up over 45K. So that's absolutely killed me that I've traded out because he, he just looks sublime on the weekend. You know, some nice marks, obviously booted six through the big sticks absolutely shattered that I've traded this bloke out and uh, I think he'll definitely keep his spot for the short term anyway. I can't see him going out of the side for the next month. Connor Manager never really rated him as a player at Richmond but was the fourth highest scorer for the Roos on the weekend. This should bode well for his job security especially since he plays for the worst performing side in the comp. Look don't expect 90 plus scores from him each week and I'd have him closer to the 60 to 65 mark for an average, most likely. You're paying up more than what the average rookie costs, but should get games and should make some short-term coins. So if you want to bring him in, you can. He's obviously on the bubble, but you are paying that premium price for him, unfortunately. Pryor may keep his spot with some injuries at Brisbane, but doesn't have great scoring potential. And that season average of 46 is pretty spot on in my opinion. So I can't really see him averaging above 50 for the season. But look, he's played okay. But for Supercoach, just not a good selection, even though he's looking to go up 31K this week. 
And Ryan Mansell, I bought him in last week, mainly through necessity. It's not like I really loved this selection, and I knew that he didn't have great job security, and most likely in the next two to three weeks, he'll be out of the Richmond side again. But look, there have been a lot of injuries this year. He could keep his spot, but I think, yeah, probably in the next two to three weeks, he'll really struggle to stay in that side. And I did mention last week, I think, that if you look at if you looked at that Richmond team sheet on the weekend, he's the clear standout and probably the first out of the side, unfortunately. But yeah, certainly don't look to invest in this bloke. There are much better options. Any of the blokes that you see above there, I think will be a better option than Mansell, to be quite honest. And last but not least, Chris Burgess, an average of 61, three round average of 52. That break even is now up to 42. So only 10 points difference, or sorry, a difference of 10 from his three round average compared to the break even. When that's the case with rookies, that's usually a sign that they are ready to cull. So if he hits 57, he'll only make another 6,700. So there is no way in the world, and this is very obvious that you don't invest in him. Do you trade him this week? Uh, is it worth trading him to a manager? Oh, look, probably not for mine. I'd wait for maybe even a Lockie Jones in a few weeks. Or else I do have the coming soon star there, Martin Frederick and Nathan Murphy. So Frederick went 80 plus over the weekend, brother of Frederick from Frio, forget his first name, sorry about that. And we've also got Nathan Murphy who played for Collingwood over the weekend, didn't set the word on fire Murphy, but he is an option. But I do like Frederick, I do worry about his job security, but he performed extremely well. We'll talk about him next week, Frederick, in a lot more detail. Do not go early. That's my advice. Do not go early on these rookies. We've already seen what's happened with one of our Port rookies and Lockie Jones. It is always a huge risk. So for me, I don't love any of these selections, to be quite honest. But uh, yeah, Cozzy, if you've got him, that's a good sign. Menadju, it's up to you if you get him, but really couldn't recommend any of the other options. I'll just wait for Frederick next week, see how he goes this week, and maybe look to make a decision there. Now let's take a look at some of our premium midfield options. The man up the top, David Mundy, you can see that I've got the old man symbol there, Mr. Burns. I was at the footy on the weekend with me mate Brent, and he suggested, look mate, you need an old man symbol, why not chuck Monty Burns there? So that's no offence to David Mundy, because I, sh I may have even... Well, I should have even put a fine wine there because he's getting better with age. David Mundy, 579,000 average on the season of 117, which is right up there. Three round average of 133, break even of 51. If he looks to go anywhere above 100, he's making money there. Unbelievable, David Mundy. I just, I'm shocked by his form, but really, really happy for him. Do you go him? Look, he's, he's really, really tempting. In the, in the form that he's in, but he's an old man, and that just does worry me. So, yeah, as much as I'd love to recommend him, I just don't think I can at his age, and that may be not fair on him. I'm not too sure, but just the way that I feel, just my opinion, I suppose. Hughie McCluggage, I absolutely love this man. A three-round average now of 124. This is a really interesting option because... Now, I'm going to mention this with lots of the Brisbane players that look to go through that midfield in this video. But we all know that Lockie Neal's out. So Hugh McCluggage, does he become more of a permanent inside midfielder? I'm just not sure if it's going to be the case. If that is the case, he's going to be a super, super selection. The type of bloke that loves hitting the scoreboard can definitely play outside as well. So maybe can have some relief time on the outside. Really good endurance. The Rolls, the Rolls Royce, sorry there at Brisbane, so I love everything about this bloke. Now, super coach wise probably the knock on him has been his consistency, but if you're going off recent form with the last three round average, then he is right up there with the top midfielders in the competition, and with Lockie Neal out, that probably means positive things, or more positive things for Hugh McCluggage, or maybe does he even cop a bit more attention? Actually, that could be the case. I'm not too sure. Depends where he plays, but Hugh McCluggage as a selection is an ultra pod, but I'd probably pay up a little bit more for a safer ultra Brisbane pod as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. Mitch Duncan just never liked this guy as a selection. Last year was a real fake primo for me, but 
a three-round average of 125, an overall season average of 123, a bit of a different role this year, 61 for a break-even. He's looking to go up 25K, get close to the 600 mark, but I wouldn't trust Mitch Duncan. That's just maybe personal bias. If you're looking at the numbers, then it suggests that this is a good week to actually purchase him. He's got a good buy as well, which is another arg argument for possibly trading him in, but I'm just not a fan of Mitch Duncan, to be quite honest, and just don't see him in the top tier of midfield premiums. Jay Gromira, durability is always a concern for me with him, but again, three-round average of 113, that's okay. Sammy Walsh, absolutely love this bloke. I think that he is the best buy out of the lot here. Everyone that you see in this list, Sam Walsh is probably the man that I would recommend to bring into the side. Also Bont, which we'll talk about in a minute. But an overall season average of 119, three-round average of 121. I'm not going to go through all the numbers with this bloke because I've talked about him a fair bit already. But he's just really, really consistent. I love everything about Sam Walsh. You know, he's, look, some of his disposal at times can be a little bit sloppy. But we see that with the best players in the competition. You know, your dangers, your dusties, and these types. So I can forgive Sam Walsh for that. He's an absolute young gun, a rising star in the competition. And I think that he's almost entered or, yeah, very, very close to entering the Uber Elite. And I'm picking him to finish in the top eight highest averaging midfielders this year, Sam Mulch. And I really don't think that's too much of a stretch now. I said pre-season, I rated him in the top 10. I think top eight now is realistic for Walshy. So if you don't have him, I highly recommend him. Got a good buy as well, which is handy. So yeah, all four Sam Mulch, I think he's the best buy. Benny Keys, ultra pod, 112 average. I mentioned in my, my round review video, averaging more than Titch this season, which just bugs me beyond belief, but I love Benny Keys as a bloke, I suppose, because he did used to play for Brisbane. I've met him on multiple occasions, and just one of those fellas that's just super friendly, loves having a laugh, loves a joke as well, really well liked by the other players as well. So I just wish Benny Keys all the very best of luck for the rest of his career, and hope that he just continues to smash it. Absolutely love the bloke. And again, one of those players, and again, probably not super coach relevant, I won't talk too much about him, I'll stop here, but just puts in 110% effort every week, Benny Keys. Josh Kennedy, again, the old man symbol there, Monty Burns, too risky for me, wouldn't go there. Ollie Wines is a pod, just, yeah, never really interests me, but you look at that three round average of 116, that's good, but then you look at the season average, 103, pretty mediocre. Joel Selwood, Mr. Burns, I write him off every week, but he just continues to score well. Maybe just get him into your side. I couldn't do it personally, but at his price, there's probably still a fair bit of value there if he continues to smash it out of the park. Lock and Neal, Gonski, got to sell him. Um, there's no negotiation about that, just got to get him out. Tuke Miller, this bloke. Super, super pod. His name was brought up a couple of weeks ago, and I probably did mention it in the last stock market video and said that I'd find out the name of the person that did it. So apologies again, I've completely forgotten about that. But you look at that three round average of 125, a season average now of 116, which is always pretty healthy at this stage of the season for even a midfielder, I think. Break even of 94, so he's not looking to go massively up in the short term. Odd much prefer to wait on Tuke Miller. I know we've already had six rounds of data, but yeah, you're still just not sure, are you? When, when you're paying that much for a name like Tuke Miller, is it just the name? Are we underrating this bloke because he plays for Gold Coast? Maybe we haven't seen enough of him. You know, a really nice role down there. Back in the day, he was more of a tagger. Uh, so yeah, he's a really interesting pick. I probably couldn't go there myself, but again, if you're looking for a super pod, go for it, I think. The Bond, I think he's also a buy now. Look, what's going to happen with him, given the fact that Dunkley's out of the side, I don't think anything. Now, the big mistake that I made pre-season was getting too held up about what was going to happen with this player, that player, that player in the Dogs midfield. I should have just backed my gut and said, you know, do you know what? It should just be Bond, McRae and Dunkley, you know? But then it's so hard to do that when you've got Libbers and Trelaws and, you know, rah, rah, rah. But... With the Bond, I just think that he's going to be a good selection. He's going to be a premium midfielder. You look at his average on the season, 116. That's up there close with the best. 
And you look at that three round average of 125, which is the second highest or equal second highest on this list. So I think that he's fine to bring in a 95 for an average. Do you bring him in? Sorry, do you bring him in if you have McRae as well? Well, that really does depend on your buy structure. But uh, I love the Bont as a selection. Champion Data seems to like him as well, which has been frustrating as a non-owner over the years. But uh, yeah, if you want to bring the Bont in, or if you're looking for a Lockie Neal replacement, or even a Josh Dunkley replacement, I think that Bont is a really good selection. Zach Merritt, he's actually hit form in the last few weeks. I have no idea why his break even is in red there. I won't go back and edit that too late. Sorry about that little mistake there. But his three round average is 117. So a couple of weeks ago, his season average was only around 105, I think. Maybe even a 103, not even as high as that. And now that's up to 110, which again is healthier. But compared to some of the other blokes here, it's actually not that great. So a little bit underwhelming so far, but... I said this in my round review, I feel that he gets ripped off a little bit by champion data. Does a bit more than 110 average on the season, I think. But anyway, probably personal bias because I own him. And Trav Boak, again, I don't have the old man symbol on there for him, but I do have the watch symbol on him. I don't own a Port Adelaide player, funnily enough. So I do rate the Boak selection, but I'd probably rather get him towards the end of the season if possible. But again, he's relatively pottish, not a super pod by any stretch of the imagination. Lots of people jumped on after his really, really hot start to the season. But unfortunately, yeah, his three round average is down to 104 now. But again, break even of only 100. He can probably achieve that and looking to go up a little bit in price. Adam Trelaw, well, look, for me, that durability concern usually overrides the positives to this pick. But what are the positives? Well, he's got a three-round average of 116. 102 on the season isn't anything great, particularly for a premium midfielder. But we do look for recent form, and recent form does suggest that he is playing well, possibly some more opportunity in the middle, given the fact that Josh Dunkley's out long-term. So if you're interested in Adam Trelaw as a selection, again, I can see why. But personal preference... I just wouldn't look to go near him. Just too much of a risk. Um, yeah, we'll more than likely have some sort of an eagle during the season, I think. Jack McRae, on the other hand, his teammate is an absolute must-have. I think this trade makes sense. If you've got some DPP, Dunkley to McRae, I think would be a really, really good move. I'm considering that move myself. And Jack McRae's just been killing me. Not having him in my side. Look, an average of 131 for the season, 141 over the last three rounds. That break even is 108, well in the green there, and he's projected to go 144. So another 16K, we're getting close to the 700K mark. So there's nothing to suggest that anytime soon you'll be able to get him for sub 600K. So now is probably the time to jump on. However, you may decide to go down the value path where you may be able to make an extra upgrade next week, whereas people that go from a Dunkley to McRae may not be able to do that because they're sideways or slightly upgrading this week. And I'll keep on saying Josh Dunkley because I've got him, but also Lockie Neal, obviously, in this conversation as well. Now, Nat Fife, if it wasn't for that durability concern, I would have a buy now. So I've still put the buy now symbol, but with durability because personally, I wouldn't do it myself. I wouldn't take the risk myself, but you can't deny... The man's form, 128 for the last three rounds and 117 over the season. That's up there with the best. Now, nothing like McRae, but he's a bit of a different beast this year, Jack McRae. I love him as a player. Love him as a selection, apart from the durability concerns. So Fife is normally someone I target towards the end of the year where that durability concern lowers, I suppose, because there's only a certain amount of games, you know, five, six games left for the season. So... If you want to go him, it is okay, I suppose, but you do run that risk, and he hasn't got a really friendly buy uh, missing round 14 with some of the other popular options in our mid this year. Track, again, another one with a round 14 buy, but he has hit form as well. The difference between him and Fife is that season average, 117 v 110, but that three-round average is basically identical. So the track has hit some form. You could bring him in this week, I think he's certainly a buy now, but I'd prefer to watch him. 
just for another week. I know that you're probably not in a position to do that, so it's hard. So you've really got to make your own decision there. But personally, I'd prefer just to watch him once more, just to make sure everything's good. But his disposal's been right down, his efficiency this year. If he can improve that, that would go a significant way to improving his average. So I do like the selection. I do rate him as one of the best midfielders. Well, certainly top 10 midfielders or potential top midfielders this season. If you want to go for him, I think that you can. Jared Lyons, absolute pod. Really, really like this selection. And again, I think he's even a buy now. Now, the break-even's in red, 122. But look, the average, three-round average, 115 and 116. A real consistent type scorer. Someone that can go really, really big. And he's now going to be Brisbane's number one midfielder. So I think he has the potential to go beast mode, particularly without Neil in the side. And he really, really gets tagged. So I'm a big fan of the line selection as a pod. Look, we are paying over 608000 for him, but you are getting a fair play here with, a, you know, as I said, an average of 115. So... They say that if he goes 111, he'll lose about 5K there. But what's 5K when you're spending around 600K? It's not too much, is it? So I endorse this pick. I think he could be a really, really good selection. I think he's only in 1.5% of sides, which is a bit crazy as well. So if you want to get Jared Lyons into your side, I think it could be a really successful pod, but a little bit riskier then someone, for example, like the next man we'll talk about, Piggy Oliver. So he's actually cheaper than Jared Lyons. So my advice would be, if you don't have Oliver and Lyons, or Lyons, sorry, I'd go Oliver, because I rate him as the better selection, I think. But now that Neil's out of the side, that could certainly change, and definitely don't underrate Lyons. But I've got Oliver as an absolute must-have this season. You know, an average of 114, three round of 120, I think that will just continue to grow during the season. He'll work into things. Melbourne are playing really well. Look, you may ask yourself, what's going to happen to his average if Melbourne starts to lose games? And that's a good question. It may go down or else it may not. Certain players are affected by the win-loss ratio and it does have a big reflection on their super coach scores. And others stay pretty consistent. So I'll probably need to look into that a little bit more. But as an owner... I'm not looking to trade him out, so I haven't really looked that deeply into it. But I highly, highly recommend him as a trading option this week. Again, another really obvious one if you've got a Josh Dunkley, a Lockie Neal, or if you're just looking to upgrade in general, I think. Cam Guthrie, again, a little bit riskier, I think. But if you look at the season average, he's got five more on Clayton Oliver. But Oliver is in better form currently with a 123 rounder over a 108, so a 12 point difference here. So he's an ultra pod, Cam Guthrie. We know that Danger's gonna be out for a long time, so he may come into calculations for some people. You've also got players like a Duncan there at a similar type price. Um, Selwood, he's been playing well. We saw the old man symbol on, on him, or we will, sorry, we won't. <laughs> sorry, I'll probably sport that a little bit there, but um, he'll be in the next slide, I think. But yeah, if you want to go there, you can. Personally, not for me, though. Josh Kelly, just get rid of him. He's an absolute trap. Or do you get rid of him? Yeah, you probably have to because it just doesn't look like he's going to get back into the midfield anytime soon. Extremely disappointing because he is such a quality player, Josh Kelly. Absolute quality. Uh, and unfortunate to see him being a little bit wasted, in my opinion, in the forward line. Titch, oh, I hate this pick, hate this pick. Do not recommend him. Look, I've got... Look, I'm not. It's a big call, isn't it? Saying that Tom Mitchell is a trap. I'm not saying that he. I've got the. It's hard when I say I don't say he's a trap when I've got the trap symbol there. But what I'm trying to say with this pick is that I think he's a poor trade in selection, and I was trapped by him. You know, I got sold. A, you know, one game with a 135, and then I bring him in. He, he gets enough possessions. There was one game I mentioned last week. I'm, I'm probably just going to repeat myself from last week, so I'm not going to actually give you the whole spiel again. But all I will say is that I don't recommend him at this stage as a trading option. You probably can't afford to trade him out as tempting as it is for me to spend an extra 150-odd K and get Jack McCrane. I wish that I could. If I had a spare trade and heaps of money in the bank, I would actually do it. It's a crazy move, but I'd actually do it. I'm that frustrated with Tom Mitchell at the moment. So, yeah, my basic advice is that at this stage, he's racking up enough of the pill on most weeks. 
but he's just not getting scored well. And uh, a bit of that is due to his disposal efficiency, the way that he uses the ball by foot. Lots of his possessions are handballs, a high handball to kick ratio. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that aren't working in his favour. Don't look to get him in at this stage. Jack Steele, now, I think that he is still a must-have, but I'm sort of lowering my expectations a little bit, I think, on Jack Steele, mainly because of the fact he's not getting much help. Is He's just a lone hand there at the moment, Jack Steele. But what I'm hoping for, anyway, for, for his future prospects is the fact that Marshall is back on the side and soon Ryder will be as well. So that'll be really good for Jack Steele and make life a lot easier for him in the middle, I think. But... Do you get him this week? I still think that you probably can, but there's better value, I suppose, at this stage. With a break-even of 170, it's very, very highly, highly likely that he will be losing money this week. And if you go off his three-round average, that's a difference of 50. So you can probably get him 20 grand cheaper next week, around the 620 mark, depending on where he goes. But again, if you've got your McCrae's, your Oliver's, already then he could still be an option even this week but you're probably well you are overpaying for him and Luke Parker 568,000 he's been a pod selection had a really nice couple of scores but yeah never been a huge fan of him 104 in the season 105 for the three rounder break even all the way up to 171 so if you jumped on him as a bit of a pod selection after those nice scores bit of bad luck he hasn't really rewarded you with the faith that you put in him but Certainly don't look to invest in him. Don't look to trade him out either, I think. You know, these blokes can turn things around quite quickly. And for most of us, we simply can't be affording to trade out players like Parker when we've got so many injury concerns at this stage. On to the midfielders, 250 to 500k. This man up the top, Tom Powell. What a wonderful rookie selection. Thank you very much, Tommy. 325,700 with a break even of 22. If he gets his projected score of 79, he rise up another 25k to get to that magical 350 mark. He'll be the first rookie, well, you know, decently priced rookie at the start of the season to reach that mark. So that is absolutely fantastic. A three-round average of 90, that is absolutely fantastic. So hold on to this man, more money to be made, and I've got no reason whatsoever to trade him out of my side at this stage. He's just a really reliable on-field option each week. Dyson Heppel, a really interesting one. 389,700. He's been in really good form. Average of 95 in the season, three-round average of 96. That's probably what we were expecting at best, I'd say, from Heppel this season. I don't think many people were thinking that he'd go 100 plus, but he's got a break-even of 31, a projected score of 97. If you are looking to get on the Heppel train, which I, I don't recommend personally, but if you are, the ship is very close to sailing away. So will he keep up that average? Maybe. I don't think there's any reason to say that he won't, but you just don't want him or finishing with him as your M7 or your M8. I don't think anyone M7, geez, hopefully not, but... You just don't want to keep on to him for the rest of the season. I wouldn't say there's just too many better options in the midfield. So personally, I know from me, Shane Edwards, I think this could work really well in the short term. You've got Dusty out, Lambert's out, Presti is out. And Edwards is one of those blokes that always seems to step up when he's needed. A really, really consistent type player. Super coach wise, he's been a pot option for a couple of years here and there but never really ultra relevant. If you're looking for a midfield pod that will most likely score pretty well during the next month, Edwards is probably a man. But the major question, as it is with a lot of the players on this list, the majority of players on this list, will he be a keeper for the rest of the season? That's a big, big uh, stretch, I think. Carl Amon, 467,100, just a pod selection. You can't bring him into your midfield at that price, but three-round average of 103. He's a pretty underrated player, I think, for Port. Sebros, trap, do not go near there. Sarong's a bit of an interesting one. Chera's obviously out of the side. Does he get some more responsibility now? Had a decent score over the weekend. Break-even of only 48 now. Hasn't been too relevant this year, but with a bit of a change in role, who knows? He could make a bit of cash, but again, is he keeping material? Probably not. 
Darcy Parrish played the absolute game of his life on the weekend. 42 disposals, hit the scoreboard, won the Anzac Day medal. Yeah, would have been one of the best days in this young fella's life, I think. So 113 for a three-round average. Remember, that's based off that huge score on the weekend. A break-even of 51, projected score of 97, looking to go up 20K. This is a pick that it's very easy to get sucked into, I think. You know, all the hype after that one week. But we need to see more from Darcy Parrish. Will he maintain that midfield role? Certainly think that he should, and he will now, particularly after that performance. But there's no guarantees with that. I would need to see a lot more from Darcy Parrish before I'd actually look to select him, particularly in my midfield. If we're talking forward, bang, this bloke is in this week for me if he's a forward, but he's not. He's in the midfield. Andrew Brayshaw. This is a man that I think is close to the best buy in this group of players. Now, he's not a must-have. I'm not saying you have to go out and get this bloke because there is risk attached to selecting Brayshaw. What is the risk? It's the fact that he does not deal well with a tag. Well, that's what the data has suggested so far this season. He does actually have a pretty friendly run coming up in regards to teams at tag, but it's a bit later on in the season where he may get challenged again. Now, why do they go to Brayshaw? Well, Fife at times is just untaggable, particularly when he moves forward. It's really hard to transition because you may need a different type of player to go and play back on him when he is in the forward line, and that can mess up you with your structure a little bit. Walters, you don't really bother about anymore. Mundy, they're probably underrating him, but you probably don't look to trade a, a sorry to tag a David Mundy these days, do you? Maybe with the form that he's in, it just makes sense to probably tag someone like a Brayshaw because he has shown the years susceptible to the tag, and he's probably the easiest player to tag, at least out of those options that I mentioned. But that time on ground, a little bit of a concern. I uh, hope that increases a little bit more. What do I like about the pick? Well, we've seen that when he's not tagged, he scores really, really well. So it's pretty much with Brayshaw a matter of if the opposition put a lot of attention into him. If they decide that they will do that particularly really, really hard tag, then he most likely won't score well. But Short-term projections anyway, well, when I'm looking at the fixture, suggest that he's not going to have a lot of close attention. And a lot of this can be game-dependent. Plans change during the game, and, you know, that's very obvious. But I do like the Brayshaw pick because he's value. 479500 Now, for those people that need to trade out a Lockie Neal, this could be an option that you could be looking at, Andrew Brayshaw, because you are saving some cash here, and that extra cash may allow you to make an easier upgrade next week and be able to get to a better player next week. It's a matter of opinion what you think his average is going to be from here on in, but for me, I can see it being a 105 to a 110, Worst case scenario, maybe a 102, because I certainly think that if he does get tagged, he will have those big games where things balance out. But it's all about your own projections. For me, I do like Andrew Brayshaw, and he's in high, high consideration for my side this week. Now, would I love to go out and get a Jack McRae? Of course I would, and definitely still a major option for me. But if I look at the Brayshaw pick, I think, well, I could get myself... A decent M8 here at a really, really cheap price. The buy isn't great, which is always a concern. But if I do get a Brayshaw the next week, I may be able to make another upgrade rather than having to do a double downgrade in order to get that cash gene going in my bank again. So for Brayshaw, it's team dependent. But personally, I'm taking a really close look at him. Paul Seedsman, yeah, well, you don't look to get this bloke in your midfield, do you? But I had to give him a little bit of respect because a three-round average of 116. So good on your CD, but yeah, no way would I get him in my side. Now, Libba, he's an interesting prospect now because of the Josh Dunkley news. Now, we know that the main three in there are Bont, McRae, and Dunkley. Now that Dunkley's out, does Libba increase his CBAs? I think that there's a high possibility that that does occur. You've obviously got Trelaw. I won't go through all the midfielders because you know that the dogs are stacked with midfielders, right? But Libba is one of those picks where he's got a really, really nice ceiling, 
I think it was four years ago, maybe, I had him in my side and was an absolute premium, an absolute super coach gun. I think if he was given a little bit more opportunity in there, then that 98 average could be closer to a 105. It's all about your predictions, like I said with the Brasher in a way. Does he get that increased midfield time? Possibly. He could be an absolute pod selection that if you got on him at the right time, and if he does get that role where he plays predominantly inside mid now, he could be a really sneaky selection. So I'm looking to see how he goes this week and then reevaluate things. If he gets the role that I'm looking for, he could be the super pod selection that I'm looking for. But again, a huge risk. Just putting the idea out there is all. Andy McGrath, really not interested in him. Essendon played really well on the weekend. Average of 94 for the season, three rounds of 93. Maybe I'm underrating him, but yeah, just in the midfield, it's, it's a no. And Errol, so it's an okay time to chop him, I think. But with my personal circumstances, there's no way I can afford to trade Errol Golden this week. I've got way too many problems. And if he gets rested, that's probably a different scenario where you may have to take that into consideration. But if he plays this week, even that break even of 78, there is no way that I'm going to trade him. So I can certainly see if you're in the position to trade him, you could either downgrade or upgrade Errol. But the issue with him is that those really, really high scores that we saw at the start of the season, joking around really, but saying, could he be a keeper? Yeah, that, that's that's come down now and reality sort of set in. No one, I don't think, was expecting him to continue to score like that, but we were probably expecting a little bit more than a 57 for that three-round average, probably close to 75, 80 at least. So it has been disappointing over the last three rounds, and if you want to trade him out, go for it. But in saying that, we know that he does have a big ceiling. I'm not saying that he's going to return to those great heights, but it's very realistic that he can pump out a 90 to 100 score. So I'm keeping Errol, but get rid of him if you want. There is absolutely nobody on this list who I would recommend. Ben Cunnington, Hopper. Hopper may be the only one, you know, three-round average of 105, average of 98. You don't bring in Taranto. LDU's a trap, has a Simpkin, I think. Perryman, well, is he going to be a keeper? Is Baz a keeper? Ward, Langdon. There's just too many question marks on all of the players on this list here, I think. Paddy Cripps, he's been terrible, hasn't he, in regards to his scoring output. And Jack Billings, I've had a trap on him for a very, very long time. A burn man of mine. Jeez, how long ago was it now? I can't even remember. A few years ago now. Never forgiven him. Just one of those really inconsistent type players for mine. So, in a nutshell, I would not be looking to go anywhere near the blokes that you see in the screen. You just need to pay up that extra coin and get some absolute quality in. And the midfielders, under 250k. Not much to see here. It's probably more info on when to trade out these guys. Keep in mind, though, there are some options this week as possible trade-ins that have DPP status, and I will talk about those blokes in the forward line. But the man up the top, James Jordan, some people traded him out a little bit too early. 241,600 now with a projected rise of 34,800 if he can hit a score of 63. So the time on ground still isn't great for Jordan, which is a concern, but he's still managing to punch out some decent scores in the last fortnight anyway. So wrapped, I've got him, and I really need that cash gen. It's super important for my future plans at this stage. Lockie McNeil came on early as a sub last week which was good for owners. I think he scored about a 50 from memory, 195,400. You probably keep on to him, but if he is a medical sub again and he comes on later on the game, yeah, there is a risk that he won't get that break even of 20. But who knows with McNeil, you can sell him, you can keep him, up to you. I'm not known to personally. Will Phillips, yeah, been a shocking selection if you got him in as a rookie. I think on the chopping block, you know, an average of 41 with a break even of 42, I think this is even a corrective trade if you need to. There's nothing I like about Will Phillips. You can't play him on field. 204K doing absolutely nothing on your bench isn't doing you any favours either. So I'd probably trade Will Phillips out when he got the next chance. Sam Berry, I like him a lot more than Phillips because you look at his season average here, 53. He's got 12 points 
on Will Phillips. I'm not sure when he comes back into the side, if he does, and all the rest. But with a break-even of 43, he's also on the chopping block. But again, if you want to keep him, I think that you can. Won't be a heap of money to be made. But all you need is something like a James Jordan situation where he just goes bang, bang, couple of decent scores, and up he goes again. But not a great ceiling at all, Barry. And Tanner Bruin, man, what a disappointing rookie selection. I don't think anyone's, surely no one's still got him, have they? If you do, you're just in a terrible situation. And even if he plays, you're worried that he's not going to go above a 20. So Tanner Bruin, if you got him, again, probably a corrective trade, I think. And you'll see coming soon, Jay Rantel. If he gets another game next week, he'll be on the bubble. We'll discuss him in next week's stocky. On to the rucks. Now, I'm going to keep this pretty short and simple because I don't think there's going to be a heap of action in the rucks this week. Look, actually, the only thing you might look to do is getting one of these big boys for Josh Dunkley. We'll talk about that in a minute, but we'll start with Matty Flynn. Definitely hold for now. Still got some nice cash to be made. Coming up against Rob this week, so a big challenge. But if he goes 80+, plus, he should go up around 40k. Three-round average isn't looking fantastic, though. So people have different plans with Flynn. Some are planning to hold until the buys. But I think it's going to be hard to do that for some teams because we may need to downgrade him just to upgrade other players on our field, I think. Um, Meek, yeah, not getting a game at the moment. No good. Vardy is no good either. Steph Martin, love this bloke. A real warrior. After a nice run-run score, though, he's come back down to earth. May score better with English out, but a bit of a failed starting pick, I think. Nank, two 120-plus scores in the last fortnight. 129 last week against Max Gorn, if you don't mind. But he's also punched out a 76 and he's 77 to start the season. So expect those scores from time to time. Hickey, he's done. That's really unlucky. Look, what do you do with him? If you happen to play Flynn for the next six-odd weeks, whoever long Hickey's out for... And I suppose you can do that because he's still got a really low break even there, but it's really hard to hold some like a hickey for that long, I think. Sean Darcy hasn't gone under 90 in scores of 125, 105, 120 in the last three weeks. A good developing ruckman, but I think it's a bit of a risk for super coach. Rob, I've got the yin yang there. So scores of 55, 51 to open the season. So low, just like Nank. And then it's gone bang, 101, 135, 113. 133 and had a really solid month. If you own him, that's okay for now, but just stick with the two must-haves, which are obviously Brody Grundy and Max Gorn. Now, Brody Grundy, he's at a pretty similar price point to Josh Dunkley, so if you're having some major issues in the ruck, I'd recommend getting Brody Grundy in. And if you've got an extra 100k up your sleeve, and I know this is an upgrade on Dunkley, which is something you probably don't want to do, but you just need big back, big Max in the side. Average of 141, a three-round average of over 150, a break-even of 126 is well in the green, and he's projected to go a whopping 178. So if you don't have this bloke in your team, more than likely your opponents will have him as captain, and you're going to lose out big time here. So get in Brody, get in Maxi if you don't have them, when the time's right, sooner rather than later. And of course, always down the bottom, we have the Peanut Peter Adams. Stay right away. On to the forwards. We'll obviously start with the 500k plus players. This is absolute shambles. It's a nightmare in regards to our premium forward line this year. You can see three cells there. Josh Dunkley, he's obviously the big news this week. And we will need to discuss some of the players that we can bring into the forward line. I think that'll be more in our next slide. Apart from Jack Zebel, look, if you don't have Zebel... He's an absolute must-have. You know, this bloke, how, how's this for last month? 155, 107, 148, and 169. Absolutely phenomenal. You just wouldn't believe it. A three-round average there of 141, and they project that he's going to go 134. And that's certainly not out of the realms of possibility, is it? So if he goes anywhere near that, it's a rise of 58K, almost another 60K. We're going to see Jack Zebel. At the 600k mark, in my opinion, oh, it's absolutely nuts. It's bananas. But shelve any plans that you had of upgrading Zebel because you'll need to upgrade to Zebel if you don't have him. And I can't even believe, again, that I'm saying that. But at 541,000, average of 127 on the season and a three-round average of 141, break-even of two, 
it's an absolute no-brainer. If you don't have Jack Zebel in your side and you do need to trade out Josh Dunkley, get this man in. If you're looking purely for a forward, we know that we've got that DPP and we discussed that before, but if you're looking just for a forward and you haven't got this man, it's a really, really easy trade-in, in my opinion. And uh, I can't see him losing that role. I do not see a heap of downside to this pick, apart from his age and possibly his durability. But that hasn't really looked like it's a major concern this year anyway. I know we're only at the start of the... Well, not really at the start. We're, we're getting into the season, aren't we, now? And look, who knows, another month or two, if he needs a bit of a rest, he may. But uh, must have Mr. Jack Zebel. Toby Green, so you're always worried about the NDHP policy with this bloke, but funnily enough, since he's taken over the captaincy in the short term during the absence of Cogs, he's really, really flourished, and he's been in some really, really good form, and looking at the other options that we've got in the forward line this year, he's actually a player that is starting to stand out. So last month, 117, 120, 76, and a 108, that's given him... Well, a three-round average anyway of 101. So the break-even, that's in red with a 113. Projected score of 96. So even if he gets that projected score, he's only going down about 7K around the 500 mark by the end of next week, if that's the case, if he gets that projected score. But look, he's never a player that I can fully recommend. I find it really, really hard to trust him. But it's a bit of a different year this year, isn't it? We've got injuries galore. Um, durability, yeah, look, he can be out from time to time, can't he? That's a little bit of a concern. Obviously, as I said, just does silly things. Will get himself suspended from time to time. Is he over that now? I don't know if we can ever say that. Uh, we might need to see a couple of solid years without any incidents like that from Green, but he's someone that you could get in. He's someone that you could get in. You can't deny that form in the last month. He has been playing really well. A couple of bags of five in amongst there. Also, I know that one of the games, I don't know if it was last week, the week before, he kicked about six or seven behind, something ridiculous like that. So if they translate into goals, and he's a really skillful player, Toby Green. Remember, he's an all-Australian level forward. He could be a great midfielder as well. And if he did go into the midfield, I tell you what, yeah, jump on this bloke because he does go bananas and can just find the pill with ease when he's in the midfield. But yeah, he's such a good forward. And uh, if you want to grab him, you can because all you're really worried about is that slight durability concern and obviously the NDHP factor. Obviously being a forward as well, a pure forward, it can be a lot tougher to score than, for example, someone like a Butters even, who plays that sort of half forward and then rotates through the mid. So that is a little bit of a downside to him also, the fact that he is just a pure forward, doesn't really get a run through the midfield anymore. But Go for him if you want to. I can't believe I'm saying that. I'm not hot. Get, don't get me wrong. I'm not highly recommending him. <laughs> but yeah, don't blame me if he gets suspended next week. But out of the options, yeah, I don't mind the bloke, to be honest. Zach Butters, I think he's going to be a definite trade in when he's back. He's got a high break even there of 144. So maybe wait a week or two. See how he comes when he comes back into the side after that injury. And look, who knows how he scores when he comes back. But wouldn't it be lovely to be able to pick him up for around that 450k mark? That'd be ideal. So, yeah, big fan of Zach Butters. I think I've seen enough already this season from him. It's still hard to work out exactly what his role is, but it seems friendly enough. He's been scoring really, really well. So, yeah, definitely someone to keep on the watch list and hopefully bring into our sides when he comes back. Rowan Marshall, so I was massive on him during the preseason, was an absolute lock, did not leave my side until the preseason injury news. 557,200 with an average of 91, went 130 plus, or was it right on 130, I'm not too sure, last week. The week before, he was really underwhelming. Um, we know that players get a bit rusty after they haven't played in a long time, but Ryder is coming back into the side, I think think this week, possibly next week. So I'd really like to see how he goes playing with Ryder in the side as well. It's a lot harder for him to get that 130 type score with Ryder in the side. Certainly not saying that he, he can't or he won't, but I'd just like to see a little bit more data, I suppose, and a little bit more evidence before I select Marshall. Remember, he does have that round 14 buy as well. So yeah, look, we may even be able to see how he goes and possibly look to get him in after the buy. But he's a player that I really rate. Um, 
I think that he, from, from here on out, he does have the potential to be around that top eight mark for averages, given the fact that we've just got some, I won't say duds, but some yeah, underwhelming, I suppose, selections in our forward line this year, in regards to premiums, I mean. So, Rowan, my advice would be to hold off for now. He's obviously got that high break even as well with the 146. See how he goes in the next week or two, particularly when Ryder comes into the side. And if he's looking to go that 100 plus, then definitely bring him in. He's in my plans for sure, but it's a matter of when is the best time to bring him in. And we'll just have to see with him, but I wouldn't recommend bringing him in this week anyway. And Danger, he's obviously a must sell. I started with Danger and then I, I went to Titch in round two. So that's been an absolute train wreck for me. I should have just found the money and gone with the Jack McRae. That would have completely changed my season. If I had have started with Jack McRae, I would have been a trade up because I wouldn't have had to trade Danger out. And I'd be, geez, how many points better off? Titch has just been terrible lately. So uh, yeah, yeah, unfortunate. But uh, I don't think anyone's held on to Danger. If you do, you, you just need to get rid of him. On to the forwards, 250 to 500k. There's not a heap of names here that I like. I will discuss a few more in a little bit of detail, but I suppose we'll start with the man up the top, 2 meter Peter. I must admit, I haven't followed his career too closely, but surely that was a career best game. Did play really well, showed signs of the play that he could be and hopefully will be for Essendon fans, but very hard to trust for mine. Does Philip stay in the side? Possibly. That combo seemed to work really well, but are we even considering this man after only one decent game? Certainly not for mine, and hence why I've got the trap symbol on him. Mitch Lewis, he's at a bit of an awkward price point at 254k. Still got a negative break even of 8. Three round average of 80, which is pretty nice. But I think the ship has sailed on this one. He's projected to make another 35k, which in 2021 is really, really nice. So maybe the ship hasn't quite sailed yet. But again, he's someone that I probably wouldn't trust but you're saving 120k on right. I still wouldn't, yeah, suggest any of these options. Darcy Cameron, average of 93. He's been a little bit of a tease before in previous years, more around that rookie price, but there's no way in the world that I'd be looking to pay 302k for Darcy Cameron. But at the same time, he has performed pretty well. And with a projected score of only 58, he's still gonna rise 28k. So if he goes closer to that season average, then that projected rise will be closer to the 40k mark. But a huge risk for mine. Uh, job security is always going to be a little bit of a worry. So for me, Darcy Cameron is a no and a bit of a trap, I think. Joey Danaher, just hold because his break-evens in the negatives. Beautiful. He'll still look to make some cash. Luke Jackson, again, after a really nice game, 100 plus on the weekend, I just think that he's a trap all. So he's not going to spend a lot of time in the ruck with Big Maxi going down there. Look, a really great, young, developing player and looks to be a star of the future for the Ds. And I know I know he's not relevant now, but uh, Cozzy Pickett, who we'll talk about in a minute, I think they may have actually done pretty well with those selections in the end because I was someone that thought, oh, geez, big risk there on the big fella in Jackson. And Cozzy Pickett, yeah, probably a bit of a reach. But their form this year has shown that they have a really promising future, I think. But Luke Jackson, not the super coach this year. Tommy McDonald, he's a really interesting prospect. Have a look at that three-round average, 111. That is right up there for the forwards this year. An average, a season average of 94. Again, not too bad, but is someone that, again, and I'll say it again with most of the blokes, if not all of the blokes on this, this list bar one, they are very, very hard to trust. Does Ben Brown come back into the side soon? I think he's nearing a return, same as Sam Wiedemann. How do they affect Tom Mitchell? I'm just not too sure. And because I don't have the answer to those questions or I can't even really make an educated guess, I'm just a little bit scared to go there myself. But with a break even of only nine, a projected score of 112, which is pretty much spot on what his three round average is, he'll look to go up 45K. So short term, yeah, looking pretty good. But long term, is he a player that you're going to want to have in your side for the rest of the season when some of these other options that maybe have been underperforming at the start of the season hit some form possibly? So 
I can see why people are interested in McDonald. There is no denying his great form. Just a different man as compared to last year. I thought he was absolutely done, Tom McDonald. And Melbourne were really keen to let this guy go. They'd be wrapped with the decision that he ended up staying. And I know that he did say in the preseason that he's going to work ultra hard. They did give him some really honest feedback as well. And I think a lot of it was around his fitness. So during the preseason, that was his number one goal. I've heard a couple of interviews with Tom McDonald, and he worked like an absolute beast uh, during the off-season this year. So I think he's reaped the rewards of that. Also handy that Brown and Wiedemann are not in the side, which has really given him a lot more of an opportunity this year. So a no for me, but it may work out. But again, round 14 by, not great. Gary Rowan, I'm not going to say anything but the absolute trappiest of traps. This man had a really nice score over the weekend, but he's more than likely next week to punch out a 30-odd score. So absolute trap, Gary Rowan. Do not get sucked into this bloke's round six score. Same as Rankin. If I spelt the name right there, there this Isaac's double A-C and K's and... It's really hard to get your head around some of the spelling of names these days, isn't it? But again, I've just got the trap symbol on him because he punched out a 100-plus score over the weekend. And it's the same as Tipper. I'll speak about Tipper while I'm here very, very quickly. He's just so up and down. Tipper, when he's on, he looks a 100... Well, a hundred. I was going to say a 100 bucks. He looks a million bucks when he's on. And he's a really, really talented player. But like many of these forwards here, consistency is the major issue. And if you look at that season average of 78, a three-round average of 73. Given the fact he's had that really nice score on the weekend, it only shows what he's done the previous few weeks. So Tipper, absolute trap for mine. Do not look to trade him into your side. The next man, Shy Bolton, is a really interesting selection. 453,000 forward mid, DPP status, a season average of 87, nothing to write home about there, but a three-round average of 106. Attended 12 CBAs over the weekend out of 21, so about 50% there. Prestia is gone out for about three to four weeks, which bodes really, really well for his scoring potential. So, Shy Bolton last year, when Prestia went out of the side, his CBAs increased by a lot, and that was fantastic, obviously, for his scoring ability. And if you look at his last three weeks, Shy Bolton, he's gone 110. 110 and a 99. So that's a really healthy three-round average there of a 106. So given the fact that Prestia is out, he could be spending a bit more time in the mid. Dusty's obviously gone for this week, maybe even two, as we said before. This could be an opportunity for Shy Bolton to absolutely skyrocket in price if he gets that role. Now, the issue is what happens with this bloke when these players return to the side. Kane Lambert's another one who's not playing at the moment. So look, what happens when the Dusties, the Prestiers return? Does he keep up that mid-time or predicted mid-time? Probably not because they also tend to play shy a fair bit in the forward line as well. Sometimes I think through the wing, but the Bolton pick is such an interesting selection and it's a really hard one for me to get a read on. I think it's a better short-term pick than it will be long-term pick. So it may look really good maybe for the next month, depending on his role. But after that, I'd be a little bit concerned because look at that season average. It is an 87. A big reason for that is the fact that he did score, I think it was a 20, 30-odd score in round three. And I think before that, it was a couple of 80s. But consistency is a little bit of an issue with Shy Bolton, but I don't think it's his fault. If he's played in the right role, uh, well, super coach friendly role this is, then he's a pretty consistent scorer and does have a fair ceiling. Really exciting type player. It can be damaging also. But when he is thrown into that more forward role, then it can be really hard to score consistently, as we all know. So he's a player that you select with a little bit of risk, hoping to reap some rewards in the short term. But as I mentioned before, in the long term, I am not overly confident with this pick, but given the lack of forward options this year, I would not blame you if you traded in someone like a Shy Bolton. Bailey Dale didn't have a great score, I don't think, over the weekend, but 
Look, he's taking a few of the kickouts down there now. I think the dog shared it around a little bit over the weekend, but Dale with a three round average of 91, break even of 59, certainly some cash to be made. Is he going to be a top six, eight, ten forward this year? There's a slight possibility given the lack of options, but for me, he's just too prodish and I don't really think the upside is there at 422. You're taking a big risk that he's gonna be a keeper because you don't wanna trade him in and have to trade him out. There's not much more money to be made at this stage. There's certainly a little bit and he'll go up slowly if he continues to average around that 90 mark, but not for me, Bailey Dale. Harry Mackay, again, yeah, key forwards this year. What is going on? So against my boys, kicked another bag, but can he keep it up? I'm just not too sure. I just don't like the selection, but yeah, 415K, if you're a Carlton supporter and you love the bloke, go for it. And Jarman Impey, so here's the buy now that I've got here. I think this is, if you're looking to go along the route of downgrading from a Dunkley and maybe using that extra money to upgrade this week or next week elsewhere, maybe from a Golden or one of these types, then Jarman Impey could be your man if you don't have him in your forward line. So you are making 200K there that you can then spend elsewhere. And I think that he's gonna be a really, really reliable option for us this year. I think he's actually currently in the top six for forwards as it is. So with a three round average of 100, a season average of 99, he's got the best season average that we see out of any bloke on this list. So I think he's just a really safe option. Jarman Impey got a fantastic role, ultra consistent, as I said before, so I really, really recommend this pick if you don't have him. This is if you're looking to go the downgrade option from Dunkley rather than just a straight swap or an upgrade in the midfield using some DPP or even to one of the next blokes that have got on this list. I would highly recommend Jarman MP, certainly if you don't have him. We start to see some more interesting names on this slide and players that I think are more realistic targets we may look to bring in this week. Remember, this is if you're going down from a Josh Dunkley, and I keep on referring to the Josh Dunkley injury, but I know that most of the people in our community anyway own Josh Dunkley. So yeah, it's a big topic for this community anyway. So Nick Hines at the top. I know that George is a bit of a fan of Nick Hines, and I think he's mentioned that he's not an overly sexy type pick. And Look, he hasn't really got a great ceiling. The highest score of the year is 102, then a 98, 93. Then he's got an 85, 77, and a 76. So you are not getting the ceiling, but what you are getting is some pretty good consistency. I think that three-round average of 90, season average of 89, so really close there. I think that's probably what you're paying for and what you're going to get from Hind for the rest of the season. You'd love to see him have the ability to go 115 plus we haven't seen that yet but at the same time it has only been six rounds we've seen him go over the ton once close to the ton another couple of times so definitely not out of the realms of possibility for him to have a really big game he's got a pretty good role there we know that they love getting the ball in his hands really exciting type player takes the game on loves to have a bit of a bounce not bad with his disposal and really i don't think that mckenna or sard have been a huge loss for the Dons in the end because he's really stepped up and played admirably in that role. So would I select him? Uh, look, he's not really on my radar. There's probably a couple of other blokes I'd pay up a little bit more for possibly, but if you're looking for someone around that price, you're saving a couple of hundred K. If you are downgrading from Dunkley, I can certainly see why you'd look at him. And to be quite honest, if George is looking at him himself, then that's pretty much good enough for me. So Nick Hines, if you want to get him in, you can. I still think it's a little bit of a risk and I don't like the fact that he hasn't got a big ceiling, but again, doesn't really have an ultra low floor either. Cozzy Pickett, won't talk much about him, but the question mark, if you do look to select him, will he be a keeper at 406? He may hover around that sort of top 10 to 15 mark, I think maybe by the end of the season, if all things go well, but that's probably not enough for me. And in saying that, it's really, really hard to predict at this stage, isn't it? Who those players will even be, even the top six um, at this stage. So never say no to Cozzy, but someone that I'm not really ever taking a close look at. Tommy Atkins, 399,200, break even of 75. 
it's funny because he has some really, really nice games and you think, yep, he is certainly a keeper. And then at times you think, well, maybe not where he has a bit of an off game. But again, a pretty consistent type player. Just had the really, well, one really off game for the season so far. Do you bring him in at 400? Well, it's again a matter of do you think he's going to be a keeper? If you don't think he's going to be a keeper, don't do it because he's probably more of a stopgap where you might need to use another trade on him. So again, this is just your decision and based off your predictions for the top six to eight, even up to 10 forwards, I think. Stevenson, absolute trap. Do not go there. Say it every week. Sam Reid, again, I just think he's a trap. But look, he's got a three-round average of 108, which really stands out, doesn't it, when you look at this list. And the second highest average out of all the players here. So maybe I'm not giving him enough credit, Sam Reid, but he's just someone, massive durability concerns and just not a realistic target, in my opinion. Chatty Warner, hold this bloke. I think we've had a lot of carnage in our forward lines lately, and the last thing we want to be doing is getting rid of someone like a Warner at this stage, even though his break-even is at a 76 now, which is six points higher than his three-round average. Supercoach giving him a projected score of 83. I don't know what he'll score, to be quite honest, but anywhere between 76 to 83 is pretty realistic, I think. So I'm holding on to this bloke for as long as I can. A very, very small chance now, I think, of being an absolute keeper. But will, I think, continue to make a little bit of cash if he continues to go sort of that 80-plus mark. Steel Sidebottom, so certainly need to discuss him. Look, to be quite honest, I was not a fan of this bloke whatsoever as a starting pick this season. I thought that he was overpriced, probably overachieved in a super coach sense last year. And he's never been one of those ultra premiums. He's always been up there with a pretty consistent average close to 100, but he's never been one of those players that's been a must-have midfielder like your Olivers, McRae's, Pendlebury's, Selwood types back in the day. But he's always just been a really solid contributor. So still saw bottom, a big turnaround in the last couple of weeks. Played on the ball with a load of CBAs on the weekend, 88% to be exact, high score of the year after another change of role because the week before, I'm pretty sure that he played a little bit more on the wing has lost a fair bit of cash so far and at a decent price he's had calf issues from memory at the beginning of the season and at his age that's always a big concern red flags for sure he's known for his elite disposal usually but that's also been a little bit off this year now with with side bottom i think that it comes down really to one thing and that is all about his role if he continues to attend as many CBAs, and I'm, I'm not even talking 88%, let's just say 75% of CBAs, then I think he could be a good selection. The issue is obviously that there are some durability concerns and with him at his age, it's not great having calf issues. Similar man that I will talk about at the bottom of the list here. But at the same time, and you'll keep, me, you'll keep hearing me say this, is that we are very void of, forward options this year and we do need to look at players like side bottom now at this stage particularly when there's so much carnage going around now do you trust him in your side for the rest of the year that's up to you he doesn't have a great buy that round 14 buy the dreaded round 14 buy but if you predict that he's going to continue the role that he played on the weekend over the next well, it, it will really have to be for the majority of the season, then I think he can go for it. He's got that DPP status, which is ultra handy at this stage of the season where he can flip between midfield and forward when needed. I'm not going to say definitely buy him now. You do see the buy now there symbol, but you can see it's half the size and I've got the binoculars there. So I would love to watch him and see what he does this week. But I know that we don't really have the luxury of doing that because his break even is in the green there at 78. He will look to make a little bit of cash this week and we probably can't afford to be holding Dunkley or leaving on the bench for another week um, before we make our decision. So it's a tough one, but ultimately you'd want to wait another week on him just to see if he continues with that high amount of CBAs. But if you've got to make the decision this week, it's really hard for me to give you advice. I'm probably sitting on the fence. I'm not going to bring him in personally. Doesn't really suit my 
buy structure at this stage, but if you want to bring him in, I don't think that he's going to be a terrible option. Nick Cox, he's been pretty good for owners this year. Look, started the season, I had the poo symbol on him, and then all of a sudden I had the yin-yang because he's gone bang-bang with a couple of 90-plus scores. He's slowing down a little bit, um, so you look at that projected score of 66, his break-even is now at 78, so it's always a concern when one of our rookies' break-evens exceeds their season average. And if you're looking at 60 compared to a 78, that's an 18-point difference. They're giving him a 66, which is one up on even his three-round average, only looking to lose about 5K there. So he's certainly not a must-trade-out, definitely not a must-trade-out. You can hold on to him because he's got that handy defensive forward status. So that's always a great thing to have on your side, particularly with some carnage that's going on. So within the next few weeks, he's definitely on the chopping block if it suits whatever you're doing, whatever your plans are. But I'll make the point again, certainly not a must trade out by any stretch of the imagination. Zachary Bailey, Zach the Rat Bailey. I absolutely love this bloke. I've got a lot of man love for the rat. Look at his price, 378900 Now I was seriously considering this guy Pre-season, I'm glad I didn't start with him because look at that season average, 76, three-round average of 65. So certainly nothing to write home about in regards to a super coach average this year. But remember, he did kick a winning goal, which uh, was absolutely fantastic from a Brisbane Lions supporter. I just rate this bloke. Now, consistency is the main issue with Zach Bailey. So for him to be a really good super coach option, I think that he probably needs another year in the system, and he needs to have a permanent role in the midfield. He's just got that explosive pace, offers some different tools to a midfield rotation, but at the same time, he's a bit of a Mr. Fix at the utility. He can play back, can play forward, can play in a wing, can play on the inside. He can basically play anywhere apart from a key post position, so that doesn't work in his favor at times, and getting thrown around from here to there and everywhere can make it difficult to score consistently. So given the fact that Lockie Neal is out though, he may increase those midfield minutes on the inside. I'm hoping that that, that oh, I can't talk, sorry. I'm hoping that that is the case. I'm not too sure though. It's a really hard one to predict because you've got your Dev Robinsons, you've got Reese Matheson, Matheson, who's there again, I'm stuttering again, or slurring my words. Reese Matheson, who's been smashing it in the reserves. I think he kicked four in a half last week so it's really hard to predict what's going to happen in the Brisbane midfield but what I think will happen is that the man who is next on this list will increase his midfield minutes that's my prediction anyway so I was a huge no uh, at the start of the season went as far as calling Zorko trap like but with the lack of options on the table I've changed my tune a bit and that's okay to do I think because you do need to alter your thinking based on the current circumstances that we're faced with. The plan for Zorko pre-season was to play predominantly forward and to play a leadership role down there. Said he was looking forward to playing alongside Cameron. And at his age and a next generation of mids coming through and some quality mids at that, the move just made sense. And in a super coach sense, this put me off. Combined with his durability concerns with his Achilles and calf issues last year, so a combination of less midfield time and some durability concerns, I was a hard no. But suddenly, after round one, Rayner, who was looking to massively increase his midfield time in 2021, he went down with a season-ending knee injury. And now we obviously have Lockie Neal Gonski. So it means that Zorko, in my opinion anyway, needs to increase his mid-time even more. Maybe, as I said, a Dev Robinson comes in and plays his natural role. It's a possibility, but I think Zorks should get some nice mid-minutes. He's been a reliable scorer in the past. Last year was a bit different, but that was a strange year. But he does have runs on the board. Plays Port this week, which isn't great. But aside from durability, he does, he does seem like a viable selection. Has that DPP, slim to what I said with side bottom, which is really, really handy. And another thing that's really hurt his scoring particularly this year, has been his lack of discipline, given a heap of free kicks away, and that's really hurt his average as a whole. So if he can 
I suppose, work on that discipline and show some more leadership as our captain, then that will go a long way to improving that and getting closer possibly to the 100 mark. So with an average of 94 for the season, a three-round average of 91, I can't believe I'm saying it because a couple of weeks ago, it was just a hard no. I am actually considering bringing this man into my side this week. The concerns are durability. I certainly understand that. But the reason why I selected Lockie Neal at the start of the season was due to his great durability. The reason why I ended up investing in Dusty, or not the reason, but a big reason, again, was his durability. Jordan Ridley, who's someone I thought has pretty good durability. So we can't plan for these things, which is really unfortunate. So I'm not at this stage going to let the durability concerns get in the way too much. Because remember, before last year, he was super durable. Rarely missed a game, Zorko. Um, The other concern is that he did mention in the preseason that he will most likely have to manage this for the rest of his career or manage or be managed or, yeah, you know, reduce his training loads a bit as the years go by. But with the options that we've got, the current circumstances that we're faced with, it may be a risk now that I'm willing to take. We'll run through these guys pretty quick because, to be quite honest, there's no one that I like as a trading option. The Tomahawk, just to know from me, season average of 85, projected score of 116. He'll look up to go about 10K. A no from me. Phillips is a massive trap. Unfortunately, he did trap me. Tex, unfortunately, some people did trade him out last week. Thought, look, he's made us our cash. Maybe he'll start to go downhill now. But he's right up there in overall scorers and averages this year. So at this stage, I'll just be holding Tex, maybe even for the whole year now. Looking more and more likely as each week goes by, that he could be a potential keeper. And again, who are you going to trade him out to? There's no one else that you'd really want at this stage that's not injured. So keep Tex, do not trade him. Chad Wingard, absolute trap for me. Look that break even, 133. Remember a couple of weeks ago, it was pretty low, and I said just no, 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 he'll be a trap. Consistency is a major concern for me, and that's what we've seen here. Absolute trappy. Same as Walters, he's been a trap, and I've had that on him since the start of the season. Heaney, durability is just always a major concern for me. Three-round average of only 60, break-even of 144, no way for me. Jordan Gowie, NDHP, durability, just trap written all over him. I don't know why he would have started him. No offense to those people that did start him. That's a bit harsh, but uh, just a terrible starting selection and someone that was never, ever even on my radar. And Dusty Martin... I'm not going to go on and on and on about this bloke because I think I talked a lot about him last week in both my round review and the stock market. But he's a keep. I don't think that you can trade him out. How long will he be out for? Possibly two weeks. I've heard if he needs an extra week to rest up that leg. And I did mention in my round review, that's extremely frustrating for Dusty because I hadn't heard about that leg issue for the last couple of weeks. Is that a bit of an excuse for his underwhelming performances if you're comparing those obviously to his first two rounds they're certainly underwhelming maybe i'm not too sure but he's looking to lose money in the short term who knows he could come back and bang out a 135 he's got the capabilities to do that dusty but after that low score on the weekend he really is looking to leak some cash if you are not a dusty owner this is just perfect for you because he's guaranteed to be a top six forward this year and you'll be able to get him at a really, really nice price. So wait, what is it going to be? Probably three weeks, and then just bring him in. Make plans to do that as well. Make sure that you've got cash. You're working out who you're looking to trade out because he's a must trade in, I think, if you haven't got him, you know, when when he's at the right price in a couple. And finally, on to the forwards, sub 250K. So it really was a coin flip for the best buy this week, but you've got to put on someone... And I've gone just with Jai Farah there. So priced at 184300 with an average of 71 after his first couple of games. Now finds himself on the bubble with a negative break-even of 64. Looking to go up about 43k if he can hit a projected score of 64. So he's a mature body, playing down back. He's averaged 17 possessions per game. Should hold his spot if he keeps performing, I think, in the Gold Coast back line. A friendly role has shown the ability to score well. So I think he's fine for a trade-in. 
almost a coin flip between him and the next man, R2-D2. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, so I'll just use a nickname from now on, I think. But similarly priced, about 10 grand difference there, 175500 with an average of 67, so only four points difference from Farrer above. Ne- negative break even of 31, looking to rise 33K, but don't, they've only given him a projected score of 46. So at a guess, I think that their projected price should be pretty similar after... The, oh, sorry, their price rise would be pretty similar after this round. But again, playing off half-back, has some speed and adds some flair to the north back line. And look, we all know the ball's been down there a lot and he has shown the ability to intercept, but still not 100% sure on his job security. He should keep his spot in the short term, particularly in the north back line. And like Farah has the ability to score well. So it's a bit of a coin flip between Farah and R2. Your choice, but I think they'll end up being pretty similar for averages. Bo McCreary had him as a buy-in option last week, but I wouldn't say the ship has sailed. Don't rate him as highly as the two options above, or don't rate his scoring ability as highly as I do the two options above, because he's got that forward role, whereas Farah and R2 are obviously playing out of the back line there. Anthony Scott, Scotty, just keep making us some cash, mate. Absolutely brilliant. Negative break even of eight. That's fantastic. Finn McRae, really unfortunate. Originally was in my trade plans, but when you look at that average of only 39, negative four for his break even. That's okay. Only looking to rise 18 grand. I just can't afford to bring in blokes that have a low scoring potential at this stage. Now, it's all about the role. We understand that. If he attends more CBAs, of course those numbers are going to go up. But I don't trust Nathan Buckley, and I just don't know what's going on with him. So although he's on the bubble, he's got that mid-forward status. I think that we may even be able to wait one more week just to make sure. But the issue is that with one of the other above options, you are having to pay what's that an extra 60-odd K. So that's your issue there. If you want to get someone in that may have some future potential with some DPP status. You could get Finn McRae in, but it's really hard to recommend him when you've got some other options here, albeit they're going to cost you a little bit more, but are averaging 67, 71, and the man below him, 72, Dev Robinson. So Finlay McRae, you can get him in if you want. Originally, as I said, he was in my plans. This is ultra frustrating, but personally, I'm most likely staying away from him. Dev Robinson, 225,800 with an average of 72, break even of one. If he hits a projected score of 66, he's looking to go up about 28K. So I watched Dev play against the Dogs a few weeks ago down at Ballarat. He was playing deep forward and I basically crossed him off my list. But I do rate him extremely highly and he's being played out of position. However, there is a chance that he may take up the Lockie Neal spot. Berry out also helps him, but... If someone like Reese Matheson comes in, for example, yeah, I'd probably avoid because Matheson's the type that will play that inside mid role. The price puts me off a little bit. Look, if he was back to 170K, I'd probably jump on. I know you could have done that not long ago, but circumstances have changed, and I think things may be a little bit more in his favor now. So it's all about the role that Dev plays. If he spends any amount of time in the midfield or a decent chunk of time in the midfield, this bloke will score well. He's an absolute gun, Dev Robinson, in my opinion, and a really, really big part of our future going forward. So I really hope that he gets the opportunity. And if you do pick him up now at 225, then you could reap the rewards if that, then you could reap the rewards if that does occur. It's a little bit of a gamble, but it's, it's not really a safe gamble because you are paying over 200k, but at the same time, with Lockie Neal out and some of these injuries that we've got, there is a chance for him to really step up with some more responsibility. I'm just not sure if that'll happen. So as a Brisbane man, that's probably the best that I can do for you. Look, if I was a coach, I'd have him in there in an absolute heartbeat because I rate him extremely highly. He won the Lark medal back in his uh, back in the under-18s carnival as well judge best player during that tournament so 
yeah, he's a really talented player. Slotted on draft night, was expected to be picked up in the first round, and then Brisbane pounced on him the night after or the day after. So, uh, yeah, really rate him. But, yeah, it, it, it's a it's a tough one whether or not you bring him in this week. Do you pay an extra 50K over Farah or R2? Or do you go 100K below and go with a McRae and just hope that his role changes and he comes good? That's up to you. I can't really answer that question for you, unfortunately. Bergman, he's come back, uh, back on the side, 22,300 if he can go a 51. Stone, don't know a heap about him, but wouldn't look to invest. Waterman, disappointing. I said in my round review that Ben Rutten lied to us. He said he looks to be an integral part of the 22 moving forward. He, he didn't play last week, didn't play well the week before, but the conditions just didn't suit him. And what scares me is the fact that Phillips and Two Meter Peter did work well as a combo. So not sure when or if he comes back in, but I really, really hope so for my cash gen and just having someone on my forward bench as an emergency. Tom Campbell, yeah, well, I've got the DPP there, but look, really, an average of 37, you're not going to go there, are you? Fullerton, job security is always a concern, and I cannot see him coming in unless we've got an injury to a Dan McStay, Joey Danaher type. And even then, Connor Ballenden's breathing down his neck for a, for an opportunity, sorry, in the 22, if injury strikes. And you've always got Archie Smith as well if he comes back from injury also. Archie Perkins, mid forward, 209,400. Average of 48, three round average of 52. Looks a lot better than what he did in the first couple of matches, but a break even of 17, projected score of 48. Not much meat on the bone to trade him in. You do not trade him out at the moment, though. Still some cash to be made. And the last list of forwards, under 250K. It's not about buying here. It's probably all about selling, I think, at this stage. So Josh Tracy, the only appropriate symbol for him has got to be the poo symbol. The break even is in red and it's 26. So an average of 24. It'd be really frustrating owning this bloke because you can't even use him as a loophole if he's playing. So really disappointing selection, Tracy. But apparently the, the coach has said, look, it will be a slow burn. We are looking to persist with him. So see how he goes. Brockman, I think he's on the chopping block from now on. Look, it's not ideal because he hasn't made us basically any cash so far this year, but apparently had a really poor, quiet game in the reserves on the weekend, so can't see him coming back this week. Who knows what to do with him? Maybe you need to trade him and get someone that's actually playing so you can start your cash gen again. Sam Flanders, I've got a void there. A really talented type player, an early draft pick, but things haven't really clicked with him so far at the Gold Coast. And at 192,300, I just think there are better options on the previous page that we just went through, yeah, R2D2s, etc. James Rowe, 232,600. I knew it would happen. The first time that I filled him, he gets a really dud score. So I've got the yin yang on him. You just don't know what you're going to get from week to week with Rowie. And uh, at this stage, I think he probably is on the chopping block. My circumstances will not allow me to trade him. I'm planning on keeping him for the short term anyway, but plans could change. We'll see how things go in the next couple of weeks. If you've got the luxury to be able to trade him out, you can go for it. But he's certainly not a must trade, I don't think, at this stage. Paddy Dudd, I've got the potato there. Get rid of him ASAP. Harrison Jones, he's been a bit of a dud rookie. I've got the chopping block on him there. You really don't want to because he hasn't made really any cash. But then you look at the break even. It's 39, only 39, you say, but it's in red. Average on the season of only 37. So really disappointing. You knew it was going to be a slow burn when you selected him. What I'm hoping for, particularly as a non-Jones owner and a Waterman owner, is that Jones gets a rest. Look, he hasn't played overly well for the season. And I honestly believe that Waterman can probably provide a bit more than what Jones can at this stage of his career. Jones, obviously a long-term option. And that's probably the reason why they do persist with him, I think. But yeah, I'd love to see Jones get arrested and Waterman come into the side. Hopefully have a really good game and make it hard for uh, the Bombers to drop him again. And we'll finish off with Braden Campbell. So I got rid of him last week. Yeah, it was last week um, due to the fact that he was the medical sub. Or was it the week before? I'm, I'm not too sure. Jeez, it's, what are we, six rounds in, I'm already forgetting this stuff. But it has been a long video. I can't believe that you've actually stayed with me. 
guys. Um, but his break even 65, projected to a six of 54. So he's looking to go down about 4,700 if that is the case. So he's on the chopping block whenever you like. But always keep in mind that he has shown that he's got a nice ceiling. We've only seen it once though. So how much can we take from that? Was it just something that's out of the box and out of the ordinary? Maybe, but uh, I'd be looking to chop him as soon as you can, I think. And lastly there as well, coming soon, Riley Thilthorpe. That's a, it's a bit of a tongue twister. Not a tongue twister, Thilthorpe. Hard word to say, the name to say. But uh, he's a ruck forward, around the 200k mark. Early draft pick for Adelaide. Really exciting over the weekend. Think he bagged four or five goals, but we will discuss him in a little bit more detail next week. So that wraps up things for this week, guys. Thanks as always for sticking with me. Apologies again for the late upload. I've been saying this for the last couple of weeks, but I have just been super, super busy. My eyes are probably red as tomatoes at the moment because it's getting late. I've been staring at this screen for a very, very long time and I'm not going to have the time to go back and edit it. I've probably slurred some of my words and stumbled here and there. I can't even remember what I've done during the video, to be quite honest. So I do apologize for maybe the lack of quality in the way that I speak. I am really, really tired now. So I hope everything goes really, really well this week. Obviously, we needed to have a fair discussion because lots of the people I know in this community have suffered with the Josh Dunkley injury. Many others have locking the on their side. So they are obviously two must trade out targets this week, or not trade out targets, but trade outs this week. And even with Dusty Martin, He's out. That hurts. We certainly don't trade Dusty, though. Do not trade Dusty. That is my firm advice. Everyone else that's not a Dusty owner currently will be bringing him in, and he will be a top six forward. So keep that in mind. And again, this is where we'll start to see some teams look a little bit different because what strategy do you use here with your Josh Dunkley trade out? Do you look for some value? Do you go like your Zorkos? Do you even go a real pod? like, uh, you know, even someone like a Nick Hines, a bit of a risk, or do you just go roll gold? Do you use that DPP swing that Dunkley has and get in a McRae if you haven't already got him? If you're running with a rookie R2, is it time to get Big Maxi in or Brody if you don't have him? There's so many different ways that you can approach the Dunkley trade out, and that's what I love about Supercoach. This is where we're gonna start to see some different tactics, and I think there'll be some really interesting tactics this week. I'm still not sure where I'm going because I think there's merit in lots of ways. I think it's really team dependent. So uh, personally for me, I'm looking to possibly go down the value route mainly because I don't think that cash generation this year is going to be easy. And it may be a little bit harder to complete a team than what I first thought, even with players like Zeeble and Impey as keepers because we've had some unfortunate injuries already and it's just been one of those seasons where there's just been some spanners in the works but again that's what makes Supercoach fun also so take care guys I'll leave it there stay tuned tomorrow or the next day for my Supercoach Gods video on behalf of the whole community I am going to be making some sacrifices giving some offerings to the Supercoach Gods in order to not only get luck for the upcoming rounds but luck for the rest of the season. And I will sacrifice these things on behalf of the whole community. So hopefully you can share some of the luck as well. So fingers crossed it all works out. Have a great one, guys, and I'll see you soon in the next one. Bye.